Authentic movement is a form of dance movement therapy that sources unconscious material in the body in the presence of a compassionate other. It was created by Mary Whitehouse, who was one of the pioneers of dance movement therapy. Mary was a modern dancer who studied Jungian psychology in order to help her better understand the relationship between the body and the psyche. Authentic movement can help you cultivate the garden of your full being. Most of us use only a small portion of our potential, leaving so much buried underground. Those are things that we've forgotten, that have been denigrated or repressed in some way or told are not okay about us, that we've absorbed often when we're very young, which make us feel like we're inherently broken or bad in some way or somehow not enough or too much or all those kinds of things. Those go underground. And so we don't know about them. So this work can help us begin to cultivate these seeds that have been down there, sometimes for a very long time. The form involves a mover and a witness and the relationship between them. The mover is the one who closes his or her eyes so that they can let go of any distractions in the outer environment and tune into what's happening in the body, listening to body sensations, movement impulses, bits of dream images, memory, imagination, all of that that's there, being moved by that material spontaneously without agenda or plan. The witness, meanwhile, is the one who sits with eyes open in the space, creating safety in the environment so the mover's nervous system can calm and she or he can be more open to what they're experiencing in the present moment. So the witness is helping to create safety in the environment and she or he is also tuning in to as she or see, he sees the mover and their literal movements, the witness is tuning in to what's happening in his or her body. What sensations are there? What emotions? What images may come up as you see your mover? Then, when the mover is finished, they can go and draw spontaneously, a kind of an essence drawing of what happened, or write to give more form to what was invisible in the body so they can see it now and create a more conscious relationship to it. And at this moment, they come then back to the witness, and the witness, after the mover, shares about her or his movement journey, what literally happened for them that they remember. The witness has an opportunity to, to offer back reflection in words about what they experienced and what they saw. And they do this without interpretation, without judgment, and without projection. So the mover, who's very close to that fresh, direct material, can feel safely held. We all have bodies. We all are bodies. Authentic movement can really benefit anyone in that it helps give you access to body experience, emotions, imagery, your inner life. We live in a very fast-paced culture where there are messages like bigger, better, faster, more. And sometimes our inner life, that felt sense, gets flattened or ignored. And we're not as guided by it, like a kind of compass that helps us direct our life and our life decisions. This practice also helps you learn trust in another person the witness. And as you learn to trust in the intimacy of a relationship that's non-judgmental, that really experiences, is open to, and accepts who you are, that can begin to generalize into other parts of your life, that sense of trust and openness. Authentic movement is not appropriate for people who are in crisis or in alternate states of consciousness, extreme states, 
who may be struggling with manic depression or schizophrenia, something that already involves trying to cope with upwellings of the unconscious. But in those cases, you can use many forms of dance movement therapy that offered structured interventions or directed dance to help them ground in the body and have a more solid sense of self. Authentic movement is really helpful with anxiety, feeling stuck in your head. Has anyone ever felt that? <laughs> Medical recovery, whether it's from accidents or surgeries, to help people begin to gently and safely re-inhabit their bodies, which they tend to have moved out of because of the trauma of the surgery or the impact of accident. It's also very helpful if there's a history of abuse of any kind, physical, sexual, emotional, psychological, or of neglect, where you have the experience that your primary experience goes unnoticed or is unimportant. And that again may have happened very early in your life with early parenting figures who for whatever reasons were not able to respond to the immediacy of your needs, your expressions, and to mirror that back and let you know that you exist and that what you're experiencing is alive and important. It helps a lot with addictions and there's a lot of addiction in our culture and in many other cultures and this can be through substance abuse of any kind, alcohol or drugs, or through compulsive behaviors, which we can really understand as ways to try to medicate ourselves to numb the body so you don't have to feel the feelings that are there. Or with some substances to change the feelings in the body or the kind of energy in the body rather than using that intimate contact with yourself to really come to know yourself more deeply and what's upsetting to you and what gives you joy and when you feel like you are connected to your dream and you're connected to the others who are important to you in your environment and to a sense gradually of being a member of a community and of belonging. The body is the home of feeling, the house of memory. To heal, we need access to it. Authentic movement is really wonderful in clinical work. You can use many ways to enter into this practice. For example, when people come in, I often listen for themes that are going on in their life or for difficulties, things that could offer good starting points. Sometimes working with a dream image or a body symptom can be a place to begin, or working with the opposites, which is something that Carl Jung did a lot with active imagination through drawing and writing and so forth, and in this case, through movement. So for example, with opposites, it may be that the person has a really hard time moving forward. They tend to hold back. Or being more open, they tend to protect themselves or remain closed. Or maybe receiving instead of giving all the time. Or the reverse, giving. So you can begin with any of these pairs of opposites and then enter into the movement from there and let go of the opposites then and see what comes up from your inner self that begins to move you. So you begin with an intention and then you drop into surrender to see what moves you. In terms of an example, I'm thinking of a young woman I worked with some time ago. I'll call her Andrea. Andrea was bright, productive, um, a lovely young woman who came in saying she felt really, really stuck. She had a history of sexual abuse. She was anorexic and she had feelings of wanting to take her life. Um, she didn't know what she was feeling. She had a lot of feelings, but they were down there and she wasn't connected with them. So as she described to me the pressure she'd been under and who she felt she should be, how productive, how good, how smart, all of these kinds of messages she'd gotten from her family and from the culture. Um, I could see that she was really holding her body and the anxiety that was piled up. And at that moment I said, 
See if you can close your eyes and notice what's going on in your body. And as she did so, she suddenly dropped to her knees and began pounding the floor of my office really hard. That made me nervous. I thought, I don't want her breaking the bones in her hand. It was quite fierce. So I snuck up and I slipped a cushion underneath her fist. And at that point, her fist landed on the cushion and she paused and looked really furious. Um, And she said, I'm stuck. I don't know what to do. I hate this. I had intruded on her finally being able to express this and it made her feel stuck. And so at that moment, this is, a, this is something that we can do in authentic movement. We can introduce a movement prompt or um, a suggestion of some kind. And so I said, see if you can engage your imagination so that we can help safeguard your fist. Imagine that your fist is coming down on the cushion and push Let yourself push, and now imagine that your fist is going down through the floor, down, 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 and see where it wants to go. And as she did that, with her eyes closed, she found herself deep down in a kind of basement, a dungeon. And in the dungeon, she saw all of these unlived parts of her life. There was the athletic part of her that she'd left behind long ago. There was the really smart part who was curious about learning. There was the forbidden, sensual part that was curled up in a corner, really frightened. There was a little girl part that was very joyful and loved to play. At that moment, as she described this to me, I said, choose one and see if you can step into it and embody her. And as she did so, she began to bend her knees and then at some point begin to sway and a little bit of flow came into her movement. And as I saw her there as her witness, I could feel my legs really for the first time. They felt very strong. I had a sense of feeling quite centered and very alive and quite excited about a possible future for her. At that moment, I said to her, I see you. And I reflected back the different movements to help her remember and bring them to consciousness. And she said, I am so sick of being what everybody thinks I should be. I just want to be me. And after working in this way for a period of time, she became a mother and she developed a very creative career in which she was using parts of all of these elements that had been down in the dungeon. There's a neuroscience professor called Dan Siegel. Many of you may know him. He has a wonderful model where he uses the hand to to replicate as a metaphor for the brain. And in this situation, here we have the spinal cord that that brings up all the sensations from the body and feeds them into the brain stem at the center of the palm. And then into the amygdala, the, the limbic system, the emotional part of the brain here. And then we have a chance Here's the the cortex and the prefrontal cortex, which is the pause, stop, wait, reflect part of the brain. So when a lot of charge, for example, comes up, like something that feels kind of dangerous, it comes up through the body, through the spinal cord, into the brain stem, and starts juicing up the amygdala, which is kind of the red light or the red flag for danger that signals fight, flight, freeze. At that point, when that's going on for survival, the blood goes to those, let's get out of here, parts of the body, you know? And at that moment, the prefrontal cortex flips its lid, 
It goes offline. I'm not thinking about how to do this and do this and do this and make decisions. I'm out of here. It's, we could compare it to a circuit breaker in a house that if there's too much electrical charge that goes through the wires, the circuit breaker flips. And it preserves the system. We call it psychologically dissociation. But it's there to save your life. It's a brilliant neurological response in the moment. But then you get cut off and you can stay dissociated from how you're really feeling. And that's where dance therapy and authentic movement come in to help you reconnect. At that point, when you're doing the movement, you have the possibility of reconnecting with the body sensations, the emotions, imagery, and to begin to rewire the brain so that sensations and emotions that were once intolerable, just too much, you were never really held there and never really got to go through them and to reflect. Those now <laughs> have a possibility of being reflected on and rewiring the system because now you've had a positive experience so you have more choices. We could think of the mover, kind of a model, as the limbic system that's feeling and sensing that vital part of the brain. And we might then think of the witness as the prefrontal cortex, a functioning as kind of an external prefrontal cortex that begins when you come together to help you reflect on the immediacy of your experience and to gradually find words for it. So now you can stay in your body. You don't have to, to flip. And we can then go from body to word. Up through the body into the emotional centers of the brain, the limbic area, the high right where we have access to imagination to dreaming again, to getting back on course, and over into the left language-making centers of the brain. We can complete the loop and reintegrate and have new possibilities in the brain in the process. So in conclusion, I want to leave you with an image. Jung described something he called individuation, which was the process of becoming your authentic self a more fully realized self with a more meaningful life. And he often used the image of an acorn. So if you can imagine an acorn that's full of the potentials of your life, that given a safe enough environment with enough nurturing can grow into a great oak. Thank you. Thank you.